Hi there, I'm Jonathan Larson. I am an extension entomology professor for the University of Kentucky. My job is to talk to people about our six-legged friends that live out in nature, uh, and I get to research them as well and learn all about the world of insects and their relatives. So cicadas are what I think some of the coolest insects in the world. They are these larger uh, sized insects that come out usually in the later part of the summer and they're the ones that sing really loudly in the trees. A lot of the ones that we experience here in the United States, we call them the annual cicadas. They come out later in the summer, they appear every year, uh, and they you can kind of set your watch to them. Then there's this other group of cicadas that are called the periodical cicadas or magic cicada. They're given this name because they appear only periodically. There are two distinct kinds. There are 13-year cicadas and 17-year cicadas. That means that they spend most of their life below ground, feeding in the tree's root zone. Uh, as a nymphal cicada, they live under the soil for 13 or 17 years before they get to emerge as adults in unison. Uh, there are different groups of them across the country that do this, and we call those broods. Uh, the different broods have different years that they emerge, so it doesn't all happen in the exact same calendar year. But this year, we're getting to experience two broods coming out together in sort of the same geographic region. With this, it's gonna be like the world's biggest insect Mardi Gras, basically. We're talking about billions of insects that are going to climb their way out of the ground. They will do this at night. Uh, usually happens right around the time that iris plants are blooming in the landscape. So if you have any of those growing near your house, they can be an indicator of this. And when they come up, they shed their last nymphal exoskeleton. So they stop being babies and they become full grown adults. They get their wings and they take to the trees. And then it's just this huge party. There are all these insects in the trees. The males are the ones that sing. They will start by singing and saying like, what's up, what's up, I'm over here. Uh, fellow dudes come and hang out with me and we'll all sing together. We'll start a band and then maybe uh, attract some girls to this particular tree. And then they get together in a chorus which is the really loud noise that people will experience this year. It can reach the decibel levels of a jet airplane. And as they make that huge noise, the females will flock to these loud trees. They'll pair up and then the male will sing a courtship song, kind of play like a guitar solo and try to convince a female to choose him as her mate. Absolutely. So when we talk about the periodical versus the annual, that is one of the big questions we get. You know, why wait 13 years? Why wait 17 years? Why be a teenage bug? Uh, that seems kind of like a strange adaptation. One thing that it, we believe it has helped with evolutionarily is that with annual cicadas, we actually have some things that specialize in feeding on them. We have cicada killer wasps, which catch the annual cicadas as they fly. They sting them and parasitize them and bury them in the ground so that their babies can eat those cicadas while they're still alive, kind of like a, a horrific alien from the movies. They've also got some beetles that specialize in eating on them, and that's because they are a very stable food source. They're there every year. You can rely on it. With a 13 and 17 year pattern, they are these prime numbers. They're odd numbers, sort of even mathematically for us. And that means that there is no specialized predator or parasite that only uses periodical cicadas as a resource because they just can't base their own life cycle around them. So with this particular brood pairing, it probably won't happen for another 203 years. The last time that this occurred, Thomas Jefferson was the president. Uh, this particular pairing of brood 13 and brood 19, it doesn't happen very often. I love talking about insects. I love to meet people and hear their opinions on insects. They're one of the few animals I feel like that are constantly going to inspire conversation. You can talk about other groups of animals and you can get you know some mez and some uh, but with insects, either people love them or they hate them. There isn't always a lot of middle ground and it spurs a lot of really interesting discussions. And I like to use my job and I've spent my career trying to show people just how amazing and integral they are to the world how we really truly need insects as part of our lives and we shouldn't try to get rid of all of them. And I was just inspired by people that I saw growing up uh, on TV that talked about nature, 
who kind of held the same attitudes, usually about bigger organisms with spines and fur and feathers. But uh, when they talked about animals, it was just very inspiring. And I kind of want to bring that same energy to the world of bugs.